Thank you all for coming for today's distinguished lecture. It is uh, a week of attrition since AAAI is happening at the same time, Wisdom is happening at the same time. Eric Horvitz is at AAAI, Susan Dume is at Wisdom, Harry Shum is at Wisdom. So we, uh, it's, it's awesome that whoever else uh, is in Building 99 has come on down. Um, are there any announcements before we get started? Any? Cool. Okay. So. Uh, it's a privilege to host Eva Tardosh uh, for the distinguished lecture today. Uh, Eva is a professor at uh, Cornell, and she was chair at 2010, I remember for sure. Um, and she's won so many awards. Uh, uh, I, I noticed the bio is not yet up to date. So she's won things like the Fulkerson Prize, the Godel Prize, but uh, the EATC is, is not yet up on the website, or it's not showing up on the bio. <laughs> um, uh, she, yeah, she won EATCS last year. and. Um, She's done foundational work in algorithms, uh, most famous for network flow. I, I know the first computer textbook I picked up was Kleinberg and Tardosh. The first time I actually saw algorithms named after people and things like that, you know, there was like Trajan, there was the Lovas number, and there was the Tardosh function. And I was like, no, I'm going to go to AI instead. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's been amazing to see, and also the first book I picked up in grad school was Algorithmic Game Theory. Uh, so she's played a foundational role in that field. Um, yeah, her contributions are too numerous to list, but one thing I did realize in reading through her bio is it's definitely incomplete because it does not make any mention of her unwavering effort at uh, uh, diversity and inclusion and STEM outreach and things like that. I think the first email I got from you was the Expanding Your Horizons email. Uh, encouraging uh, grad students to go and teach uh, girls in middle schools and things like that. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's an honor to have Eva come give the talk today. I'll hand it over to her. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adit. And it's... <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and um, I hope you find the discussion uh, interesting, I guess. Uh, one comment on a did summary. Uh, you know, I hope you guys all do at diversity, in, 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 in improving diversity and outreach. I think there is a lot we all collectively can do. I do not keep this kind of things on my CV because I guess I'm thinking of my CV as a sort of professional, sort of my science contributions. It's not because I don't think these are important. I think they're very important, and I hope you guys all do this. In particular, especially, I mean the people who are not minority and women. Uh, this, thank you. Uh, this is an effort we should all participate in, especially the, 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 the non-minorities. Um, and I hope you guys care. Anyway, but I will limit my discussion to, uh, to, to the particular topic. So the thing I want to talk, to you, talk about today is um, how I think about learning in the context of game theory. And I guess uh, it really sort of will come in kind of two parts. Uh, are people learning in a setting where there is games? And if I can assume that they're learning, uh, what kind of things can I say about what happens in games if people were nice enough to actually play in this relatively wise manner? where I have to be careful on what I really mean, whether it's wise to learn or not, and that's what I'm going to really start with. So um, that's the efficiency part, is what can I say about the outcome of game, uh, or efficiency of outcome part. And then the first part is uh, learning in games. So what do I mean by games? I, unfortunate. I thought I had a forwarder, but apparently do not. Or, hmm. Um, what I mean is a game of some sort where uh, some players, which in, depends on the application, that particular player can be either the, uh, the, the, the uh, people driving cars or it could be a, a, um, 
you know, reroute their routing traffic, some algorithm, it can be, can be a human or an algorithm, is making decisions as you go, uh, one decision at a time, trying to repeatedly optimize some objective function. Uh, to make it more mathematical, I will assume that there are a couple of things that are written on this slide. Um, and the example here is a congestion game. So I guess the assumption of par par cars or bracket try to follow shortest paths. They try to figure out where they get to the destination of, of the fastest. Uh, of course, this is a game. Congestion, your, your speed depends on who else is going on the same path, whether you car on traffic. But there is an implicit assumption in here um, is that you're not trying to hurt other people. You're not, uh, you know, your goal isn't that other people don't get to their destination. You just want to get to your destination. And then I guess one part that will come in certainly in, in our results, or I think what's important to uh, think about in the context of, of games, I think I'm giving up on this, uh, is that uh, the traffic isn't as stable necessarily as you can hope, uh, depending on whether the Super Bowl ended or some news item went on the New York, New York, New York Times website or whatever happened, traffic does change. And so as you're a router and you want to um, optimally send traffic, you're going to have to learn or adjust to changing environment. And that's going to be an important feature as I get later into the talk. Um, I will alternate between using traffic routing and my example, or actually using auction as my example, where auction I'm thinking of mostly advertisement auction. Uh, I need to think of a setup, or that's where learning will be relevant, where we're repeating a game, such as the advertisement auction or such as traffic routing, where the indiv individual outcomes in a game are not very important. Like in ad, ad auctions, a particular value of one ad, it's a teeny fraction of a cent. In traffic routing, uh, car routing, that might not apply so well, but certainly in packet traffic, if one packet goes bad, the internet drops it and tries it again. Not that big a deal. If a whole stream of packet goes back, that's kind of a problem. It's a big problem. Similarly, in ad auction, if your whole campaign tanks, that's a problem. If one ad didn't work out, oh well. One ad doesn't matter. So I, that's the kind of setup where learning will make a lot of sense. And here again, um, the advertiser is not very fast, but can live and join the system. And there is an ecosystem where things can change as we go. So to make it slightly mathematical, I guess the game will be uh, that there are actions that people can take, put up ads, choose a route to drive, and then something happens, and you repeat this action over time. And the assumptions are uh, players somehow take the past data and figure out from the past data what the hell to do next. So that's the model of learning. Uh, I assume that the goal is uh, that they try to, on average, do well. Again, not very sensitive to outliers, but most of the time should do well. Um, and that's because uh, small value at the, each small value or cost in each period, so exploration is a good way to figure out what the hell to do. Um, and again, the idea would be that in the beginning they don't know what's up, and then later on they know. Um, so I guess that's sort of the main topic of this sort of repeated games and what the hell happens in repeated games. And I want to start with something which, given that this is the AI colloquium, maybe I shouldn't spend too much time on. Of what other, what else, you know, why, why do we want to do learning and what might be the goal of learning? And I want to start with, actually, learning and games was a topic combination that we weren't the first to start. Economists started it before AI was really such a dominant field. So uh, they were asking this question, and not the question that I might want to ask. They asked this question, oh, learning is cool, because players might learn to find the Nash equilibrium. We just figure out what might of the learning is. They weren't actually thinking of the kind of game I'm thinking of, which we, which we naturally or have to play with small stakes. They instead thinking of what they called pre-play. So they were thinking of, there's a ginormous auction going on. Think of the uh, FCC spectrum auction that just happened. Uh, but before it happened, for the previous couple of years, there were all kinds of training things going on. 
to train the auctioneers how to bid in this game. So they were thinking, let's think of this training as a learning. If you run the training before the real auction, then the players might, via the learning, figure out what the Nash equilibrium is. And then when the real auction comes, they can play the Nash equilibrium. That was the goal. So they were thinking of learning just the way we're thinking of learning, but they were hoping that learning will find the Nash equilibrium, and that basically was uh, what they hoped, and just to realize how early they started, Robinson in 51 thought about fictitious play, which apparently means, or appar means uh, what, it said, what I said there, your best response to the past history. So you watch what happened in the past, you think of past history as a sample distribution of what other people are doing, assuming they're going to sample the very same distribution, and just best respond to that. This is a sort of Bayesian-style learning assumption, that the previous behavior is a Bayesian sample from something, and you react to that Bayesian sample. Uh, and that's, the, that's what uh, Robinson was studying, and she proved, uh, by the way, just because of Adit's comment, she proved, Robinson was a woman, uh, that this preplay uh, was hoping to learn, learn uh, lead to a, a Nash, and what was hoped, and that's what she was studying, what time does it lead to a Nash, and what do I mean by lead to a Nash? I hope that maybe it doesn't need a definition either, but just in case, um, Oops, what did I do? Um, what it means that uh, they will find a solution that's stable. Stable in the following sense, that stable as a one-shot game. Now, if I take, and there is a slight awkwardness in alternating between rating and auction as my two examples, that one is a, an example where we're minimizing the delays, some sort of cost. The other one is an example where we want to maximize our utilities. When we want to minimize delays, then a good Nash solution A, this is a vector with AI is the component for player I, then this is what it means to me Nash. For every player I, if they choose to do something else instead of their own component XI, uh, AI, they choose something X instead, that would have a higher cost. That is, they don't want to do this other thing. That's what it means to me Nash. And again, the notation here is A minus I is an N minus one dimensional vector with the I's component, I's component missing, which got replaced by X. Uh, and that's what it means to be Nash. And what they hoped is somehow learning will either achieve this one shot game Nash equilibrium, so that would be an equilibrium where they repeatedly play the same thing over and over again, or at least converge to it in some sort of you know, distance, like metric distance. And I guess we would call this as a no regret assumption. And the question was, does fictitious, fictitious uh, uh, play that is best responding to the past history uh, lead to Nash equilibrium? And an unfortunate answer is mostly not. Uh, but Robinson proved that sometimes it does. Uh, in 51, uh, proved that it's a two-person, two-strategy each game, then it does. Kind of nice. Two-by-two two game. So rock, paper, not, sorry, two-by-two. Two. Um, matching pennies, which is on top of it, zero-sum. It doesn't have to be zero-sum. Any two-person game or generic two-person game, actually, uh, you know, algebraically independent numbers or something. Then it does. Uh, and then in 61, 10 years later, uh, rock, paper, scissor, that is any uh, zero sum game, two person zero sum game. And it's kind of over here. Like, remember that line is mostly not, but sometimes it does. Um, there have been other attempts in this line of work, um, which uh, I will not survey going on even today, where you, you still, the goal is to find the Nash equilibrium. And so they come up with weirder and weirder definition of learning, where really your goal is to find the Nash equilibrium and not to model natural behavior. That's not what I want to do. So I thought fictitious play is a pretty reasonable model of what people might be doing. The more modern things are not. And I disagree with the goal. Uh, I also disagree with the goal of finding Nash equilibrium. Uh, I don't know why would we want or expect players to find the Nash equilibrium, but there are a lot of troubles with it. One is uh, there are multiple Nashes, so why would I expect them to find, find one of them? Uh, it 
if it's a multiplayer game of the kind we think about the internet, many, many players, it's an incredible amount of knowledge even to know who else is playing, let alone what the hell they're thinking. Uh, and then there is computational difficulties. Uh, something that's algorithmically hard to find, this sort of distributed learning algorithm is not going to succeed in finding it either. Um, but further, you look at behavior, we know it's not happening. Uh, this is from Microsoft data, uh, which because I don't work for Microsoft, there are some secrets on the screen of the kind that I don't know the answer to. Uh, like the bits are normalized and I don't know the keyword. Uh, but this is an this is a advertiser's uh, seven day, a, a keyword on which I don't know how many, some six or seven people are, are advertising on. And this are days of days, seven days, seven consecutive days. And this is what uh, the bits look like. These are advertisers who frequently change their bid. Uh, there are ample evidence that they must be using some sort of online tools because they change their bid too often for a human intervention. They also, these are people who have insanely high budgets, which they practically never hit. So they're really using their budget as some sort of insurance. And the thing they play with is that number that you see on the screen. Uh, to me, that those numbers, especially uh, the red one or this guy here or that guy here, totally look like a gradient descent style algorithm. Uh, every now and then they adjust a little bit like gradient descent would. Um, they're learning, they're trying to figure out what to do. Um, so I don't want to model these people as, as, as playing an ash equilibrium for many, many reasons. Because learning doesn't find an ash, because they don't appear to be finding an ash. Uh, they're not that stable. Uh, instead, what I want to think of is a repeated play where they repeatedly experiment with, um, with the games. Now, if you're really uh, more econ backgrounded, then you might tell me, yes, 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 of course. They're not stable because this is a repeated game. They're doing something much more complicated. They're finding Nash equilibrium of the repeated game, which is a very, very complicated object. And I think the pictures are not suggesting that they're doing that. That would be sort of a threat of the form that if I and Adit are advertising for the same keyword, I tell Adit that, look, on even day, it's my turn. You're going to bid 0. And odd days, it's your turn. You're bidding 0. And this way, of course, we're both paying low. And that would be kind of cool. There's no evidence in the data that they're doing this. Those are very, very complicated. Um, and I doubt they're doing it. Alternately, I can claim that they repeatedly playing a one-shot game in which you would claim that on this day, that red player had a high value. That's why he was bidding high. On this day, his value changed to low. Also, it doesn't seem very likely. So none of these seem very viable assumptions. Instead, I want to assume that they're learning. And they're doing something like no regret learning or fictitious play. And there are a couple of slides here, which I'm going to flip through really fast, given that this is the AI audience. And uh, maybe um, this is something that all of you know very well. Uh, instead of playing fictitious play, which is a deterministic strategy, that is, you deterministically best respond to what happened, something that works much better, at least in analyzing, and maybe more likely something similar that they're doing, is they're not quite best responding deterministic, doing something similar to it. For example, they randomize between some relatively similar playoffs. Uh, so a fictitious play would tell you to choose the best strategy, uh, the uh, what's called often smooth fictitious play, Put, uh, put, puts in a normalization factor and, and somehow uh, try to, within similar strategies, increase the entropy. Uh, this is also the same as uh, what otherwise known as multiplicative weights and has this very nice property, what's called uh, no regret or small regret property. Remember, and here is the awkwardness, I switch to utilities right now, uh, Nash equilibrium would require, deleting this thing from the slide, that the utility of what they played is better than the single best thing with hindsight. This thing here says that's not true individually every single time step. So in Nash equilibrium, something like this, and also should delete the sums over there. It's not true every single time step. But if I add it up over time, then it's you know, almost true. Almost true meaning there's a small regret error. So let's try to analyze this is a little bit better. There is a fixed 
I can change my strategies as often as I play. Every, every player is allowed to do this. But compared to a fixed strategy with hindsight, your behavior should be reasonably good. That is, the error this on which you that would be better should be kind of small. And in particular, that rule and many other rules get your error down to somehow root t. And maybe, uh, hopefully, many of you know about this sort of no regret learning. Uh, I guess if you don't, let me say one more sentence before I try to put it in context. What this means is, if there is a really good strategy that's consistently good, I'm asking either find it sooner or later, not too fast, not too slow, that is after not so much time, or do something better. That is, if I'm driving to work, and I don't know the highway numbers here, so let's go uh, California area, maybe you guys all know those numbers. If it turns out that where I'm driving, driving in Route 101 is ideal, I don't have to drive on 101. I can drive in 280 and alternate between things. But if I'm consistently worse than 101, and there is this 101, it's so simple. I should just do it then I should, be, should discover it. This is what it's asking. And it's giving you a little error because it might take you a while to discover this fact, uh, which is, of course, natural, because you're learning from past data only. So that's what no regret learning is. And um, I guess a couple of things about no regret learning, again, maybe putting in context of where I'm heading. So the first thing I want to tell you is maybe one slide of what game theory tells you of why this might be a nice thing. But more importantly, are people doing this? Is the data bears this out? Is this a reasonable assumption? Would I recommend people to do no regret learning? So asking, is no regret learning a behavioral assumption that I want to assume? Do I want to recommend to people? Is that how, how good is this? And then I want to also tell you a little bit of what can I tell you about games if I can make the assumption that people are doing no regret learning. So actually, maybe I should cheat and flip through this and come back to it later. So let's start with, is no regret learning an assumption I want to make about the data? Or do I like it? Uh, so again, the utility terms, I want to abstract away from the exact error term, which was root t. Not so important whether it's root t or something else. If I play it for capital time t, I want the error to be kind of small compared to t. So the way I wrote it right now is a more generous epsilon times t. A small fraction should come from the error. And as, as you know, utilities go, uh, time goes, the total utility you're gaining is growing, growing with time. This probably going with time. That one should grow a little bit slower with time, if at all, at least an epsilon fraction. Now, what are good things about this uh, uh, assumption? Or uh, You can do low regret learning. There are many algorithms. Multiplicative weight is one of them. There are a million of them. And if you don't know enough of them, go ask Seb uh, or ask many of the other people in the audience. There are a million great algorithms, very simple ones. Um, the behavior. To me, the sort of, if there is a good strategy, please notice it. It seems so natural that it's even believable that humans can do this, not just algorithms. Um, very natural. Um, and one thing that maybe you'll see at the end is it's a very handy behavior model. It's such a nice equation or inequality, I can use it. It's a nice assumption that I can build a whole theory on. The same way Nash equilibrium was a beautiful assumption. And economists build a beautiful theory on Nash equilibrium as a behavioral assumption, which sometimes they're questioning but nowadays whether that's a reasonable assumption. But there is a beautiful theory built on it because it is such a nice equation. The same applies to this. Uh, but I also should confront it with data. And the data is the data set that I already showed you one uh, Bing advertisement data set. It's coming from, I already showed you one picture from it. It's coming from a paper of De Denis Nakipelov and, and uh, Vasily Sirkanis. Uh, and maybe you guys have seen some of this if Vasily talked about this. But let me remind you how that uh, maybe the most dominant feature of that data set 
Uh, so this is, again, advertisers that I can think of as optimizing something. They're changing their bits very frequently. I also can think of them as a single parameter advertisers. Their budget is so sky high that that's not real. That's an insurance. That's not a strategic parameter. It's the bit that they're changing all the time. Um, and I look at the regret, how much error they have they regret. Now, this is a plot that you should uh, definitely think about. Uh, I guess the blue bars are probably easier to see. So the regret relative to what they gained. OK, that makes sense. If you gain $100, $1 reverse of regret is different than if you only gained $1 and your regret is $1 also. So normalizing to your gain, to me, makes sense as a measure. If I look at someone out here, that poor guy is doing horribly. This is the $1 gain, $1 regret. OK, $1 gain, 70, 70, 77 cents regret. Shitty. If I look at someone down here, the guy has practically no regret. These people literally have no regret. And maybe a better way to put it, uh, the plot is maybe broken. These guys could actually have negative regret. That is, they could be doing better than no regret, which is possible because they allowed to change their bid, their bid all the time. And the regret measure is against a single bid with hindsight. So these guys might actually have negative regret here. 30% of the bidders have negative non-positive regret. So these guys are doing very well. I'm reasonably happy and can say that these guys here, uh, maybe I don't know how far I should go, maybe till here, 40, 50%, they're doing really well. These guys are not. Now, you have to be a little careful here, or I should be a little careful. I don't actually know what these guys' values are. I infer the value from, for this plot. So what I really know that these guys are doing badly. That's a fact. No matter what their value is, they, they regret is close to 50% of the utility. So these guys are all doing very badly. These guys here might be doing well, reasonably well. Uh, what does this tell me? It certainly doesn't tell me that the literal no regret is a good assumption. There was only 30% of the people down here, and 70% have some regret. And if I think about it, it may certainly makes me decide that um, I like this alternate version, which I put here on the slide. And I guess we have a, a paper at uh, a year ago, NIPS, um, working with this alternate assumption, which we called approximate no regret. Instead of comparing utility additively, I said, well, you know, a little bit of error. You can't be that sensitive. If you're within 10%, come on, that doesn't matter anymore. So one way to think about this comparison here, if I change my classically regret is an additive measure, I just compare uh, the difference between my utility and the uh, optimum utility, that's the top line. And as I pointed out, the classical measure gives you a root t kind of regret after time t. If I'm willing to give you a little bit of multiplicative error, that is, I'm willing to give you a parameter epsilon and say, you know, within 10%, I don't care so much. Please make the additive error much as small as you can, but I give you 10% multiplicative error in addition. Then you can significantly push down the additive error. In particular, I can push it down to a constant. Um, so this has all kinds of advantages. I'll come back to this in a second. But looking at the data, I think this is actually probably a better model. That multiplicative regret, like giving you a little bit of error. I, the data would suggest over 50% of the participants have less than 10% uh, regret error. Uh, whereas if I have to go with literally zero, there was practically no one. Yeah. Can't you say that like here people are reaching something like correlated equilibrium? I mean, this seems definition is almost same as that, right? Yes, I'll, I'll come back to this. Give me one second going back to the games of okay. the connection to correlated equilibria. Uh, I want to spend one more slide on um, negatives on like the, the sort of the issue. Is this a good assumption or not? But I'll come back to your point in one second. Yes, the answer is yes, and I'll come back to you in one second. So 
I don't, you know, these are all four, four, this is an assumption. I can offer you one more thing on for the assumption, and then I'm going to offer you the main argument against it. This is reacting to what it asked me to sort of try to talk about the general picture here. Uh, this is an assumption theoreticians like. I like it too. But to prompt discussion, I should be more honest that there is a, a downside. It's not clear how good this assumption is. Yeah. So going back to this, yeah. uh, the bar chart that you showed yeah. and the uh, square root t type, because you normalized it, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, the no regret is not zero regret, right? So you're allowed the square root t. It's hard. It's hard to say, you know, if you're allowed some kind of square root t, what would the distribution look like? So one but, may you know, actually coming even harder, coming more up from you. Um, actually, a base question that I don't know how to ask on this data set is what on earth is t? What is the moment I'm looking at this? And I guess uh, one thing we're looking at, which I can't show data yet, but I guess we, we now have some, some chart, like one, da some data sets showing of what happens. Like I want to distinguish between this 50% versus that 50%. 50% that I know for sure has high regret, according to what I'm looking at. Uh, what are they doing the next seven days? And my ingoing assumption, which I think the data shows is true, that the people who have high regret more drastically change their bid on the next seven days than people who I think are doing OK. That is, they too think they're having a problem. And so they're varying their bids very widely. Uh, and part of it is maybe something changed and they just woke up to it. Like this, this regret uh, is a good assumption if you think you're against a steady, a steady distribution of some sort. And if the data, if the best response changes, you should adjust. And maybe for these guys here, something did change. And they slowly waking up to this. And effectively, their t is smaller than this other guy's t. But I don't actually know. And I think this new, new data we're currently uh, collecting or I, more precisely, we'll get back to, collect, to dealing with after the EC deadline. Uh, we'll hopefully give a better answer to this question. So there are a couple other data sets other than my own that I can rely on. Um, there is a Erev and Ross in 86 ran a, a lab experiment with a two-person coordination game that I think actually is pretty good support for this. Uh, I originally started to think about some of the newer results I'm going to tell you about listening to a talk at EC14 about a lab experiment was trying to tell us that uh, people are actually not no regret learners. Um, and in fact, that's what that paper does. It's a buyer and seller, seller game. Again, it's a human subject experiment, a buyer and seller game, where uh, only the uh, Seller is a human. Uh, the buyer is an automat. Uh, the, the game is that the buyer has a, a random, uh, uniformly random value between um, 0 and 10. Uh, you are the, you're the seller. You're the buyer. You're supposed to make him an offer. No, you're the seller. You're supposed to make him an offer. And if you make an offer below his value, he'll accept. And otherwise, he doesn't. Um, and uh, what offer should you make? And if you do a low analytics, you should figure out what offer you should make. Um, that's, not, that's not hard. But most people don't do this. Uh, and especially if they weren't told that it's a uniform distribution, they would have to observe that it was a uniform distribution. They instead uh, make offers and see what happens. And, uh, a better model that fits their behavior is an incredibly recency biased version. That is, they don't best respond to past history. They best respond to what the hell happened in the last round or last couple of rounds. Do you know how many buyers are going to show up? Or is it an infinitely? I don't actually know. I should look at the paper. Do they know they're playing against a bot? Uh, I don't think they knew that. No, they didn't know they're playing against a bot. Uh, no, I did. They said they saw the playing against anyone. Uh, 
But it was a heavily recency bias. They, their behavior showed incredibly strong recency bias, and I'll come back to that point in a minute. But I think recency bias is not crazy in a changing environment. Recent experiment is more relevant than past one, which I think is fine. And then there is a recent Gali Nissan experiment, which actually played with, in particular, adduction as a, as a, a human subject experiment. And <coughs> mostly they recovered the values. They noticed that buyers that they give, or sellers that they give, teeny, teeny values on, on experiments so small uh, that they really should have dropped that. They should lose all the time. They behaved irrationally. So they didn't play no regret. Uh, one way I would explain this, that this, these poor guys in the lab experiment were forced to sit there for you know, however long the experiment was. And it's frustrating to keep losing. Uh, they were paid to sit there, but still, it's frustrating to keep losing. Uh, this doesn't quite happen in real life because people whose value is too low for this can just drop out and advertise elsewhere. So I think that's less relevant for us. But to show to you that it's not as good as, I, as, as I'm making out to be, let me actually give you what happens in a very, very simple two-person game, uh, which is almost rock, paper, scissors. So this is a standard notation of rock, paper, scissors. Uh, this square here tells you if scissor plays against rock, then scissor loses $1 and, and, and uh, rock gains, gains a dollar. The game I really want, because remember I already told you that zero-sum games things work out okay, is not a zero-sum game. It's uh, the rock, paper, scissor, except we're going to each play a deep $9 if we actually match. Um, as it turns out, this game has the very same Nash equilibrium, one third, one third, one third. That is, one third of the time, we pay $18 to a date. It's a good game for a date, not zero <laughs> sum. Uh, so question I want to ask, what happens if I do learning in this game? And I'm even willing to get you started off from the one third, one third equilibrium. And I want to actually depict this in the uh, 2D plane, because your strategy here is in the 2D plane, because probabilities should sum to 1. So this is one probability, one on rock, probability, one on paper, probability, one on scissor, and everything in between. That point here is the one third, one third, one third. And let's assume you started off of Nash, and I started off of Nash, but I'm very bad at randomizing, as, as they are all of the rest of us. And as it turns out, I a little bit too heavily play a paper. And say I'm playing against uh, Nikhil. Uh, Nikhil's learning algorithm will discover that I'm very heavily playing paper, and as a result, his playing, uh, run, learning algorithm will very play, very heavier pay the thing that beats paper, that's called scissor. Mm -hmm. However, then my learning algorithm will discover that Nikhil's learning alg uh, algorithm always does scissor. To beat scissor, I probably should uh, Pay, pay rock, thank you. Pay rock, and what we're going to do is actually cycle around like this, and the dynamic in this 2D plane will come out to, the, to a sort of cycling behavior on the boundary. On the plus part, which is cool, and uh, actually this is better than playing the Nash, better for the, uh, worse for Adid, better for the, for the two of us, because we're not paying the $9 to him, Nash would. So we thank avoiding the diagonal in an interesting way. But in particular, we're not playing the Nash, as you guys see. And what we're playing instead is a correlated Nash. Uh, the play does not converge. What we're doing is correlating on shared history. Um, what we're doing is something of this form. Uh, we both learning, so we both satisfying this inequality that our cost or utility cost is less than any other cost modulo a little bit of learning error. Um, but we correlate it, we, we're not doing it independently, hence it's not an ash. Um, okay, last slide on the model of learning. And remember the slide title is negative things about learning. So this is kind of a nice property. Um, here is the reason they're not doing it. Uh, in order to get no regret, I have to randomize. If I were to be deterministic, Nikhil, knowing my deterministic algorithm, would beat me every single time, 
would know what I do and would do the, uh, do the beating thing. I have to randomize. And if you look at those plots, I said they look like, like gradient descent, which kind of they do, but they surely don't look like they're randomizing. They're not wiggling like crazy. The people are not randomizing. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, would I actually recommend people this algorithm to do this? So this was the question, are they running no regret algorithms? And actually, no. They're not running no regret algorithms because in algorithm to be no regret, you have to randomize, and they're clearly not randomizing. Second question, would I tell them that, hey, guys, you guys should run a no regret algorithm? And honestly, probably I should not for many reasons. One reason is, what do you mean no regret against a fixed strategy? You might do better. Maybe you should try to do better. Uh, and what's worse, um, no regret is not that bad. It sort of adopts to other people's strategies, but maybe I should do better. And actually, the, no, the rock, paper, scissor example was here exactly to show this to you. If instead of automatically reacting to what Nikhil is doing right now, I know he's doing the no regret algorithm. I can predict what he's going to do tomorrow. I should react to that instead. That's a better move than just reacting to his past. I know his algorithm. I should react to his algorithm, to his next step, which I kind of know. I should do the same. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it will get chaotic if we both do this. So I'm not so sure I would react it. But I want to make a different point, and that's my coming back to being positive about no regret learning. I did not make the assumption that they're running my no regret algorithm, which they clearly are not. I didn't recommend they running their no regret algorithm. I was asking, can I mold them as achieving no regret? And it seems like I can. They can do better than getting no regret. And I would recommend they do better than no regret. But they do seem to achieve a no regret-like condition without necessarily running the algorithm. So what I want to do in, 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 in modeling this is not recommend they run this algorithm, but instead model behavior with this condition, which is not the same assumption. And I think a much better assumption than the recommendation that they, uh, they uh, reach. OK, so I'm going to give you one other part. And I don't know how many minutes I have for one other part, but use a few, some amount of minutes. One benefit of this, which I already mentioned in this one state English, but I want to give you a little context for it, is that this no regret assumption is such a clean, beautiful mathematical assumption. It's so usable. And how many, many things one can derive from it. And I would say someone trained as a mathematician is that having a clean mathematical model is definitely good for thinking about what follows from this assumption. Uh, this is where I want to go back to your point. And actually, I don't know if I can go back fast enough. Uh, there is a slide I skipped in the, in the middle, exactly this one, where I wanted to make exactly the point that you asked me about. Uh, if I take the absolute limit when regret went down to zero, relative regret went down to zero because root t, that is, grew less slow, more slowly than time, then with absolutely no regret, uh, the assumption here is was that the utility of what they play. If I take the history of of play as a, 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 a empirical distribution, then that distribution will have the Nash-like non-regret property, it will have this property that the expected utility, expectation of put from the history of player i is, um, is better than any fixed strategy with hindsight. This is called a correlated equilibrium. It's like a Nash equilibrium, same inequality, except that the player correlated and the way they correlated is that they both pulled from, both based their behavior on the same history and they got them correlated as we saw in the example. Uh, and going back to where I was, sorry for doing things in the wrong order. Um, so this says that they're converging to or getting close to a correlated equilibrium. Um, we can ask a bunch of interesting questions. What can we say about quality of a correlated equilibrium? 
And what can we say about the speed at which they converge to this correlated equilibrium? And maybe one I'm most fun of, most fan of, and one who most emphasize is, can we adjust this? And the answer is we can, even if I actually don't keep the, the game stable. That is, learning is good because learners can adjust to a changing environment. If you're learning, you're not blindly playing a Nash equilibrium and you know, hoping for the best that it stays the same game. You're watching what happens, and if the environment changes, you will learn to adjust. That's what learning is good for. Can we actually make this mathematically precise and say learners adjust to the environment and they constantly achieve or, or over, over average time achieve high, high social welfare? And the answer is yes. And in the last maybe couple of minutes, I want to give you a sense of uh, how the no, how no regret learning actually gives you enough power to prove this kind of things. So um, hopefully that's still OK. So what is the kind of thing I want to prove? Uh, this is something that uh, you uh, often goes under the name of price of energy. And maybe one uh, nice sample example of myself and Tim Ravgarden is for traffic writing. And it said that if you take this traffic writing example, then the cost of the Nash equilibrium is no worse than the cost of <laughs> an optimally designed strategy where, every, where we're sending twice as much traffic. Um, you might say that that two over there was not your favorite uh, degradation constant that you have to run with twice as much traffic. I want to point out that this is as opposed to much, much, much worse things, like what's usually known as the tragedy of the commons, where the degradation has to degrades with more participants, the worse it gets. Uh, price of energy formally defined as follows. Classically, it's about Nash equilibrium. They take the utility of Nash and compare it to the optimum. Then uh, in a sequence of papers originally studied by Blum and co-authors, and then uh, a very nice paper with Tim Ravgarden got generalized to learning outcomes. Uh, what they said is, we repeated the same game capital T times, take the utilities of the players summed over time, and uh, compare it t times the optimum. At that point, the game and the players were stable. So the optimum didn't change. And what I really would like to do, and this is the last one, is I want to keep changing the game too. So instead of having t times the optimum down here, I have to change it sum over the optimums of all those games. Um, and that's what I really would like to shoot for. Our actual model goes as follows. Um, it's, a pop it's the same game, like we're still playing traffic writing every single step. Uh, but players get replaced. And I guess we call this dynamic population. Every iteration, there is a parameter, which I can tell you a little bit more about in a sec. With some probability p, every player vanishes and gets replaced with an arbitrary new player. So what I mean here, uh, because every player vanishes with some probability p, if they are n players, then a, a noticeable fraction like pn of them, lots of them vanish every single step. So something changes all the time. Um, but because of, and because of the change is arbitrary, uh, if you stayed in the game, you have to keep watching. The situation might change, and you have to keep learning. But at the same time, because you only vanish with probability t, p, any particular player will stay long enough that learning will be viable, and in particular, um, I have to keep them in long enough that in my no regret learning assumption, the regret error will not dominate what they got. That is, so that the regret error goes, to, goes down to zero. So I have to keep them around long enough that in expectation, the regret error goes down to zero. Yeah? Would things uh, change dramatically if players were getting replaced with higher probability if they had already incurred a very high regret? Sort of. Uh, modeling this idea of ruin, right? Like gambling ruin. People who are who are currently feeling like they are losing in this marketplace, they would are the most likely to leave. Most likely to leave. No, we would be very like as long as as uh, no. It, it, if anything, it would help me. Uh, it certainly won't hurt. It's very tolerant of which which fraction. We are very important that we not replace a very big fraction at a time so that most of the people can learn. 
One way that the results are not as good as can be is that I'm only looking at social welfare, which means I'm averaging everyone's behavior. So there, are, there could be people who are doing really, really badly, and my average doesn't hurt because there are so many of them. Uh, and you're actually helping in that category, not hurting. So your way of replacing them would only make it better. Uh, problematic people would vanish. You could also have people leaving because they're winning. Yeah. Right. That, 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 might, that, that I need to think about. That might actually hurt. Like, they have to be careful whether I can keep the result that way. But it is helping because it's, it's making the, the problematic people go away. Good questions. Um, so we're doing this in a class of games that Tim called Smooth Games, though actually I'm using my version on auctions. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time explaining what these games are. Maybe a one-sentence summary is, and there will be two-sentence summary between two things. A one-sentence summary is that almost all the price of energy results are of this form, though actually that's the next sentence, so it's not here, are of this class, but given that I probably shouldn't keep talking for too long, I won't spend too much time explaining what the class is. Uh, I want to tell you one line of how it gets proven, which I think is important to sort of think about what is there to prove. So all we have is the no regret assumption, and all these proofs need is, so here these guys in this particular example would be playing a sort of auction game that they want to win one of those color things and maybe they have different values for different colors and they're bidding on one of them and that's a game because you have to decide how much to bid and which one to bid on. Um, uh, and of course, as usual with any of these, the best action might depend on what the, what the hell the other guys are doing. And, but the interesting thing in the proof that in order to prove things, I don't have to always figure out what's best. I don't have to do what's best. There is a particular action that I should not regret is the optimal solution. So if my optimal thing is to win that, that's the red assignment over here, then turns out I should not regret bidding on that guy. That is, you're not asked to bid on that guy. You're not asked to know what that guy is. But you're not regretting anything in particular. You're not regret that one either. And that's the only thing the proof uses. That is, that there is one thing, the optimum, should not regret that behavior. Um, and that's the assumption that the proof uses. There are lots and lots of papers that use this kind of proof technique. And uh, I'm going to uh, maybe go to the uh, skipping a couple of things I might come back to. Uh, showing you the one technical other thing I wanted to show you. What I want to do with this changing population, ideally, I would like you to do this. Not, not just not regret the optimum, but not regret the optimum every single step. And that actually went too far. Even if I take one guy out, the optimum might drastically change. Just to give you an example, we're playing a matching game. Here's the optimum, one guy left. Of course, the optimum changed for everyone. It's called an augmenting pass, and everything changed. But if you look careful, you can design something, and I'm definitely cheating here, called a stable optimum. That is a sequence of optimal solutions that stay stable, that is, don't change much, or rarely change, or for any one player, change, uh, change very little. Uh, I have two techniques, or we have two techniques to generate such a thing. One is specialized to particular things like matching. Uh, for example, the greedy matching is much more stable than the, than the optimal matching. So running a greedy-like system is better. Uh, but uh, maybe an even better, there's a whole technique developed out there called differential privacy, which since Cynthia Torque is a Microsoft person or used to be a Microsoft person, hopefully you guys all know about differential privacy. If you think of what differential privacy is trying to do, hey, it's the same thing. It's a different argument. They want the solution to be not sensitive to whether one guy participates or not. That's literally what I wanted too, for a different reason. So I can inherit a whole differential privacy literature and generate theorems of the form, uh, and maybe that with many, many of these games, uh, we can have the price of energy result recovered, even with changing population. I need to have the probability not go below something like one in log p. This is because I want everyone to stay around for at least log p time. That's so that the regret error 
will not dominate the behavior uh, in my bands. Um, and the bands I get is a product of three parameters. Of course, I lose the price of energy band. It's the same price of energy proof. If there was a, a band there, I'm recovering kind of the same band. I have two losses, both of which go to one as things get better. Uh, there's a regret error trouble. I have to accommodate a regret error. If the probability is, 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 is high, then they don't stay long enough. Regret error is relatively high. As I keep people around longer, regret error goes to zero. And the second is the how much it costs me to have a stable solution. As the game gets bigger, a higher population, as you might know from Cynthia's work or Cynthia's work with many other people, uh, the stable solution gets closer closer to optimum as, as it's a large population game. In a smaller population, it's harder to make it differentially private. So again, if the population is high and I kept people around relatively long time, then I recover the price of energy band. Otherwise, there is extra little bit of degradation around. Uh, and I guess I want to st end with, um, I hope with the beginning I did convince you that, that learning is an actually good assumption. Um, it is not a bad way to adopt. It's much better than Nash. If I play Nash against a bad opponent, and I will not pick on either Edith or Nikhil as playing the bad solution, uh, if I play Nash in rock, paper, scissors, no matter what the opponent does, I get zero as my payoff. If the opponent's playing badly, I should beat him. Uh, so it's a better way to adopt to the opponent, no need for the common prior. Um, and that with a teeny bit at the last 10 minutes, I try to convince you that uh, learning actually the players do well in, in even dynamically changing environments, which I think is a nice feature. Um, what I didn't do, and that's a slide I skipped through in the middle, uh, is the open question part, and maybe I should end with that, is that I did criticize learning for the kind of thing uh, Nikhil picked up on, that I should predict what the opponent does uh, and react to that. There are a few papers that are trying to say things of what happens when you do such a prediction. Uh, at the moment, they always get beaten. That is, they show something you could do with such prediction, and then say, hey, but that's happening anyhow. Uh, even if they're not doing any predictions. So at the moment, we're not aware, even though there were attempts at this, I'm not aware of any papers that says something better happens to either the players or the game overall if people, people, people play in a way that's more predicts the opponent. But I think there is a path there, and there's something good should happen. It's clearly the right thing to do. And at the moment, I can't prove anything interesting. So I'm going to stop here, stop here and thank you. If you go down that road of trying to predict what the opponent is going to play and how he's going to or she respond to you and so on, uh, do, they, do you then have to model the computation time? Do you have to think about limited resources? I certainly should. I mean, the actual attempts that are out there uh, were a very sim much more simplistic attempts. Uh, what they say is um, any of these no-regret learning algorithms and multiplicative weight, for example, but all of them, they adjust the probability distribution very slowly. That's an interesting fact. Uh, model this fact. That is, know that the distribution today is virtually the same as yesterday. And as a result, run something that they called optimistic mirror descent. Optimistic meaning that it's recency bias that is very heavily takes into account what you did today. And, um, you prove things with that. Um, that doesn't need, like it's just optimistic, it doesn't need extra computation. Uh, it didn't do the game that Nikhil was inducing me to think about, that if I'm going to take advantage of what you're doing, you should predict what I'm doing is react to that. Uh, you know, if we, it, it, it just assumed that we're both running this form of optimistic mirror descent rather than having one of us run a best response to the optimistic mirror descent, which is not, which, which is not itself optimistic mirror descent. So you're right. There is a computational problem here. Once I take this to the, to the proper level, these papers do not at the moment. Yeah. Can you connect that with the counterfactual regret matching kinds of algorithms that 
like recently the poker uh, Texas heads up, like the the heads up poker thing was solved by Libretus at CMU, and they were essentially doing that kind of reasoning, and they essentially threw insane amounts of compute and like brute forced trying to reason through all steps of uh, bidding and betting. And I'm it, it, at the core, it was a regret matching algorithm, uh, but they had to yeah. precisely think about like. What would the player's best response be to this? And yeah, so I guess this more game. actually points yeah. out that uh, an issue that I swept under the rug, despite other issues that I focused on, is that the games I was playing here, which is both traffic writing and and this bidding in ad auctions, are compared to poker. They're super simple game. It's like you know you're choosing a pass, you're choosing a. a, a uh, a bid, uh, and these these multi-land games, such as even that particular simple poker, uh, they're multi-round. Like the, the the strategy space is much much more complex. I mean, the the ratting game, which has a many pass, but you're still choosing edges. Really, it's a you know it's a shortest pass computation. It's not you're keeping parameters on the edges. That's very manageable. Poker is a much much more complex game. And there is a, certainly a lot, even running this algor these algorithms I'm talking about would be problematic in a poker because there's so many different strategies. They're doable in, in, in pass or doable in low dimensional spaces. That's a higher dimensional space. So there is a computational problem there, even with these simple algorithms. They're doing something a bit more sophisticated, but that's, the sophistication is more coming in that they're actually capable of running this. Yeah, so sorry if I missed this, but what information is the learning player being given? Do they get to see all the opponent's actions and utilities, or is that all hidden from them? Excellent question. Uh, definitely they don't see the opponent's action. Uh, to get the actual bounds to the extent that there were bounds at all on these slides, uh, they get information of what would have happened if they have done, so they need there is the, what I often call in learning a full information form feedback. That is, you don't necessarily know what the other guys are doing, but you know what would have happened had you done that. That is, thinking of traffic writing, you drive on a pass, but for whatever reason, you actually get traffic reports from everywhere, including where you were not. So uh, all actions I could have taken, I know what you I You know would what have would have happened. Uh, this is, uh, you know, based on traffic report, maybe reasonable on, on traffic routing. I'm not so sure it's reasonable on internet traffic routing, but I guess they're doing pinks, which maybe can approximate this. It is actually quite reasonable in ad auction because the, the, feed, the, the uh, feedback thing they're getting is giving them payoff curves. So they're getting this, this kind of, like, you guys, that is your company, is offering this feedback to the bidders. Uh, so it doesn't say who the opponent is. They have to go on the web. If they're a pizza company, honestly, probably all of you know the local pizza name, so they know who is advertising for pizza. But if not, they have to figure it out the way you do it, go on the web. But they do get the counterfactual fact as a, as a form of feedback, and that's what this assumes. So, so they get a curve with all the discontinuities yeah. as, as their bids like drop below other people's bids, so how things would kind of suddenly change. Yeah, they get, they, what they get as feedback is what would have happened, maybe not instantaneously, but aggregated over some period. And honestly, actually, I don't know the period lengths. Maybe over the day or over, like maybe some of you know this here. But I, like they, I think an, like it, there aren't, what I'm reacting to is you said with the drops, uh, things are random enough that there aren't that many drops. I've seen those curves. They are pretty smooth. Uh, and because it's aggregated, I think on a day or an hour or something, there's some amount of aggregation of what they're getting. But your company, as does Google, feeds back curves, curves like that, and that's what these results need. Thanks. So the main... Uh, yes. Yeah. So the, the way to look of the social behavior as people are doing this no regret behavior, so is the main takeaway is like it's like it, they converge compared to like a doing a best response as in Nash equilibrium doesn't converge because the price of anarchy bounds if you make like these games are smooth then they hold they would have hold, held it even for pure Nash equilibrium kind of thing. So like what's like what is this separates this? Is it just the convergence that this modeling 
explains that okay people converge other like if the Nash equilibrium wouldn't explain that okay why would people converge to Nash equilibrium so if I think of traffic rating then there are two there so traffic rating is one of those games where uh, best response or learning on a single game does converge to Nash because it's a potential game yeah. uh, so there the only plus getting there are two pluses getting added the speed of convergence that is what's the regret error how fast are they converging? And second, and maybe that's the end, and I really rush through it, that I can switch the player set. That it, it, it I, I'm switching the player set so fast, um, namely roughly with n players, I keep them around for one in log n time. That is a con almost a constant fraction of players vanishes every single pair of time steps. There is no way they're converging to any Nash because the Nash keeps changing. Yet, they keep the social welfare high. Right? I said that I can do this. But, but, they can't but, converge to Nash because the game isn't stable enough. If one player is around for quite a while, so he can do something, but the Nash moved around because I kept deleting and adding players. So they can't possibly converge to the Nash because there isn't such a thing as D Nash. Every single step the Nash is different. And yet, we can make statements about welfare. Oh, but that somewhat is, I feel, okay, at least the way I look at it is, is somewhat different, right? That's more, more like stability because like if a game is smooth, if, even if you don't converge to exact Nash, but you can converge to approximate Nash, you will still be good. Like the price of an RG bond will still go through if you make this assumption that game is a smooth game. So okay. I feel like so this... let me actually, like, okay, so in writing, indeed it would go to Nash and would go to approximate Nash reasonably fast. Yeah. And the only plus here is I can swap the players in and out, which I think you, you, you need to prove to me that the Nash moves slow enough. I don't think so. I think, okay. Uh, okay. But if you take auction game, auction game is not a potential game. I see. So there, uh, they're not converging to a Nash. In fact, there is no guarantee they're converging period. They can alternate the way I showed you in the rock, paper, scissor, things never converge. So That's but, not converging. So when something is not converging, then this is a separate statement. And I guess one thing I didn't emphasize, but maybe useful to say, that what this game does, as I did kind of say, it converging to the set of correlated equilibria. Now, what do I mean? Correlated equilibrium is a convex set. It turns out it's a convex set in a very high dimensional space. So when you converge to a convex set or any set, uh, you can do kind of two things. You can converge to a point in that set. And if they were to do that, which they do in writing, they do not do it in, in, in ad auctions or in, in item auctions, uh, then the thing they converge to is a, is a real Nash. But they can converge to a set in a different way. Here is my set. And here is how I converge to it. I get closer and closer to the set. Maybe I never went into it. And I certainly don't, didn't converge in the classical sense. I just converged to the set. I'm really close to the set. I'm circling around it. That's what's happening in rock, paper, scissor. In that sense, uh, they didn't stabilize. They didn't converge. But every set in this whole correlated equilibrium, the thing they're getting close to, has good social welfare. There, I proved, there the system proves something much stronger. They're not converging, period. And yet, social welfare is good. I see. So we don't know such results for like uh, Nash equilibrium, you're saying. Like if, if it doesn't, OK, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't even make sense. Well, it would make sense. I, I feel like I don't know such results because they couldn't be true. Where there's a little cheat in what I'm saying. Uh, if if uh, playing would converge to Nash equilibrium, I almost would prove that finding Nash equilibrium is computationally easy. Not quite, because I would say approximating it easy. And what we know right now is finding it hard, not that approximating is hard, but sort of under the belief that this difference is minor and really approximating it is also hard, then that thing should not be true. Learning should not converge to a Nash, because finding a Nash is hard. This is also tr hard on, on the uh, item auction game. Uh, finding a Nash is hard. So they, they, this method cannot, I, I don't have an example to prove to you that this doesn't converge to Nash, but I know it cannot because this is doable and that one's computationally hard. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank the speaker. Thank you.